this morning to worship. Happy Easter. Thank you for joining us here today. Whether you are here in person or with us online, we are grateful for your presence as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus together. Choir, thank you. Thank you for your voices this morning. Um, after worship, next door in the fellowship hall behind us over that way, our high school youth group is hosting the Easter breakfast. Um, so please come uh, enjoy their hospitality and their cooking. We've got pancakes and eggs and sausage and coffee and all sorts of good stuff after worship. During our worship service, uh, we'll be celebrating communion together this morning. And here on the baptismal font is gluten-free bread. It'll stay in the center here if that is something you need. And speaking of communion, um, over the last handful of weeks, we had four children in our congregation who were um, learning more about communion, taking classes, and uh, preparing to receive First Communion in our midst. And so this morning, we have uh, two children from our congregation who will receive their First Communion, one at this service and one at the second service. So I want to invite Lucas forward. Come on up, Lucas. Lucas was one of um, the young people who took the class this year. And so we recognize you and celebrate with you today, Lucas. Here you go. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Let us prepare our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls for the worship of God. <laughs> of faith, Christ is risen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We gather today to shout alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. 
Out of the doom of death and despair, victory comes, glory appears. We gather today to shout Alleluia. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. We shall live, witness, and recount the deeds of the God whose love endures forever. We gather today to shout hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and join with me in the words of our Easter affirmation of faith. We believe in God who is light in the darkness, never gives up on hope, and is always working for our good, who weeps when we weep and laughs when we laugh, calls us to be more than we are, and relentlessly transforms our tears into alleluias. We believe in the Christ, present at and in the creation, heard in the words of prophets, enfleshed in the birth of a long-sought Messiah, and alive in the lessons taught to disciples, who is not stuck in a tomb of despair, nailed to a cross, or buried in the past, but is living forever and walking with us on our journeys today, who is seen in our stories and present in everything we can see, touch, and imagine. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the invisible presence of God, the joy, hope, and peace of possibilities, opening all around us all the time. We believe the Spirit calls us to community, to compassion, to welcome, and to acts of mercy and justice, so that the whole world will quiver with wonder and hope. We believe in an astounding God who surprises us on Easter morning, who reveals through an empty tomb how the whole of creation is overflowingly full of God. We are people of faith in the risen Christ, and we see our Christ in everyone and in everything. We strive to live and act so that the world will see Christ rising again in us and through us. God cannot be contained, not by books, not by traditions, not by institutions, and not by tombs. God lives. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Amen.
Christ has risen, and we have risen to new life with him. Yet we must confess the ways we have continued to remain in our own tombs of sin and death. Please pray with me. Living Lord, when we stand before the empty tomb, we don't always feel the joy of resurrection. We feel fear, doubt, and distress. We feel empty. Forgive the fear that paralyzes us at the brink of new life. Forgive our doubt of your love. Forgive our distrust of your surprising, joyous plan. Fill our emptiness with your glorious light. Raise us to abundant new life for the glory of your name. Kindred in faith, hear the good news. God has forgiven our sins. Christ calls us to new life. The Spirit will lead us on into fullness of life. Thanks be to God. Amen. My name is Rachel, and I'm going to be reading Psalm 118, verses 1, 4, 14, 17, and 20. The prayer we're about to read is a psalm of deliverance. We know our need for deliverance because we know about death, and we know about suffering, and we know about conflict, and we know about sin. As people of faith, let us give thanks to God for resurrection. Please pray with me. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, God's steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, God's steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. God has become my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and renounce the deeds of the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. The stone that the builders rejected have become the chief cornerstone. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Rachel. 
The gospel this morning is found in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Listen for God's word. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be a gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Children to come down front for the children's moment. But I don't want you to take a seat. Just come on down front, stay standing. Good morning. Happy, yeah, come close. It's okay. Come on down. Two more coming this way. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yeah. I wonder if you could tell me how the church looks different this morning than it has for the last few weeks. Anybody want to give a guess? All the flowers. Yeah, anything else? The, the banner there? Yeah, yeah, there's a new banner up there. Any, anything else? Well, there was, I remember there was a lot of purple kind of everywhere. The wreaths weren't there and there was purple on the walls and there was purple on the, on the communion table. It was everywhere. It was, it was a sign of being solemn, being quiet, a time of thinking. And now we're in a time of celebration and flowers. Okay, have a seat. The first thing we noticed was the flowers. There's room over here, plenty room. 
How do you think the flowers got in here? We bought them at the store and carried them in. Okay, that's right. And some of them might even have been delivered, right, from the store. And how did the flowers come to be flowers, do you know? How did they start out? They grow them. So they start from what? Dirt? They start, well, they start in dirt, right? A seed. So someone takes a seed and plants it in the ground, and then from that seed, a flower grows. Do you know what happens to the seed as the flower grows? It turns into a stem with leaves. It turns into a stem with leaves, right? But is it still a seed then when it turns into a stem? Yeah, maybe. It's not a seed anymore. What is it then? It's a plant. So, so the seed dies and the plant comes forward in new life. Well, this morning we're celebrating Easter. We're remembering that Jesus died, but he was transformed like a seed into new life, into new plants, into new beings, into each and every one of us so that we can all reflect Jesus to the world. Let's take a moment to pray. Holy God, thank you for Jesus who allowed himself to be transformed, that we might reflect your light and your love in all the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How about a treat before you go back to your seat? The contemporary reading this morning is called The Magdalene's Blessing for Easter, written by Jan Richardson. You hardly imagined standing here. Everything you ever loved suddenly returned to you, looking you in the eye and calling your name. And now you do not know how to abide this hole in the center of your chest, where a door slams shut and swings open at the same time, turning on the hinge of your aching and hopeful heart. I tell you, this is not a banishment from the garden. This is an invitation, a choice, a threshold, a gate. This is your life calling to you from a place you could have never dreamed. But now that you have glimpsed its edge, you cannot imagine choosing any other way. So let the tears come as anointing, as consecration, and then let them go. Let this blessing gather itself around you. Let it give you what you will need for this journey. You will not remember the words. They do not matter. All you need to remember is how it sounded when you stood in the place of death and heard the living call your name. Will you pray with me? Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight and bring you glory, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Across the gospel stories in the Bible, We have several accounts of times after Jesus' resurrection that his disciples see him, meet with him, even talk with him, and don't recognize who he is. 
It's hard for us, reading the story later, to piece together exactly what's happening. But it seems that although the gospel writers are clear that Jesus was resurrected after death, God brought him back to life again. Somehow, either he has changed or they are so blinded by their grief and their understanding of the world to the point that his friends and followers don't recognize him. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear the story of two disciples walking along the road on their way to a town called Emmaus, and they meet the resurrected Jesus on the way. But they don't recognize him, and so they walk along the road together, and they start telling this stranger about their friend Jesus, who was this amazing leader and prophet who had died a couple days ago, sentenced to death by those who held power. We had hoped he'd be the one to redeem Israel, they say. In a sense, we thought he'd be our savior, but now we know he must not be because he's died. Later, they sit down at a table to join together for dinner, and Jesus takes a loaf of bread, and he blesses it, and he breaks it, and he shares it with them. And then suddenly, aha, we know who does that, they think. It is Jesus here with us. They recognize him, and they know him. And just as suddenly, he's gone. Today's story is different in its setting, but has a striking similarity of not recognizing Jesus. Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' closest followers, goes to visit at his tomb. She doesn't go any earlier than this, because the day before was the Sabbath. And now it's so early in the morning that it is still dark. It's like she was so grieved, so desperate to visit him, that she doesn't even wait until a light has broken. There's an urgency in her that she is willing to risk traveling by herself through the dark to get to the tomb. She wants to be at Jesus' grave to be there with him, to be grateful for his life and sad for his death and all that complicated mix of emotions you feel when someone you love dies. When Mary gets there, she sees that the stone that had been blocking the entrance has been rolled away, and she assumes that that means that Jesus' body is missing. Thinking it was stolen by someone, she runs to alert two disciples, Peter and John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So John and Peter run to the tomb, investigate its emptiness, and then go back home. Mary Magdalene stays, though, stays there at Jesus' tomb, crying. She is grieving both the death of her friend and the apparent crime of his stolen body. As she cries, she looks into the tomb, and for the first time, she sees two angels sitting inside. They ask her why she is crying, and she responds, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Then she turns around, and Jesus himself is standing there behind her. He asks her the same question, Why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? And somehow Mary does not recognize Jesus. Instead, she mistakes him for the gardener. But perhaps that's not as much of a ridiculous mistake as it first appears. For the author of John's gospel goes to great lengths to connect, to get us to connect Jesus with the initial creation of the world. It's how the very opening words of the gospel of John get started. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. 
The garden that we stand in in our story today, the one where Mary and Jesus stood outside the tomb, the one where both she and us first encounter the risen Christ, this garden is meant to remind us of the first garden, the Garden of Eden, the mythological origin place where God first created. Now, in this garden outside the tomb, on the first day of a new week, God is recreating, bringing life back again, starting things anew. Jesus is the gardener, it turns out, the one who brings things to life again, the one who is tending to the budding creation, the one God is creating growth in and through. Mary recognizes Jesus when he calls her by name, Mary, he says. And she says, Rabboni, teacher. And we can imagine her jumping up, throwing her arms around his neck, clinging to him in relief and sheer joy. The one she loved and lost is now back in her life. But then, do not hold on to me, he says to her. As much as she might want to hold him tight and never let go, she can't. You can't stay here clinging, Jesus says. I have work for you to do. Jesus coming back again does not mean that things will go back to the way they used to be. The resurrection is not a return to his previous life. It's the beginning of something new. Do not hang on to me, Jesus says. We cannot stay here in this old place of death. We're moving forward to what's next. And so Jesus sends her out to go and tell the others. He gives her a commission. He tells her, say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And she does. Mary goes and she finds the disciples and she announces to them, I have seen the Lord. In doing so, she becomes the first to preach Christ's resurrection. Not the first woman to preach the resurrection, but the first anyone to preach the resurrection. This image you see up on the screen is an icon that I have hanging on my wall behind my desk in my office. Mary is the figure on the left in red, speaking to the 11 disciples huddled together. It's her preaching to them, I have seen the Lord. And the men's faces are varying degrees of sadness and confusion and disbelief. I have this icon hanging on the wall behind my desk for times that I need a reminder of what it means to recognize Jesus and to respond to his presence in my life by sharing with others that good news, I have seen the Lord. There are several common phrases that we share with each other here on Easter Sunday. Things like, Christ is risen, And we say things like how God has conquered death and that love wins over fear. We repeat over and over again that special Easter word, Alleluia. We also frequently quote Paul from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh grave, is your sting? Sometimes on Easter, it can sound like we're saying something along the lines of death doesn't matter anymore with God. We live forever. Don't be sad. Be happy. We surround ourselves with beautiful flowers and bright decorations, and we blast trumpets and sing loud in grand and bold celebration. But it does us good to remember that the Easter story didn't start that way. That's part of what I love about the first service on Easter, before this one. 
Several of us gathered at 5.50 this morning down on Ashoda Beach in the dark and in the cold. Because Easter doesn't start with fanfare and elaborate celebrations. It starts with a woman by herself in the dark crying. She came to Jesus' tomb both in the literal dark and in a dark wood moment of her life. And while the other disciples came and then left, Mary stayed at the tomb and she stayed in that moment of grief. And it was precisely because she sat in her grief a little bit longer that she encountered and then recognized Jesus. She meets and comes to know her God in and through a time of sadness. It's just as we've been saying this whole Lenten season, as we journeyed through the dark wood together, when we're sad, when we're scared, when we're overwhelmed, when we're confused about life, when we're lost, when we're alone, when we're grieving. These are the times in our lives that we usually try to escape out of as quickly as we can, to get back on solid ground and out of the woods and out of the dark and back on our way again. We try to move along as quickly as possible. But these are actually the moments in our lives when God comes closest to us. If we can take a moment to catch our breath and to look around and to listen, Maybe we'll hear God's voice and see the ways God is at work in the world around us. Even on Easter, death does still sting. Losing someone we love cuts us deep. And for Mary, it's the sting of Jesus' death and her experience of that grief that actually allows her to meet and recognize Jesus after the resurrection. It's in the sting of death that Jesus comes to meet us, calls us by name, and loves us right back to life again. When someone dies, we can be happy that they're in a better place, and we can be sad that they're not here. When a dream dies, we can be open to new possibilities and we can be sad about the ones that are not to be. Both can be true at the same time, happy and sad, grieving and hopeful, holding on to our faith even when we feel uncertain. God is always with us. But it's in those moments of grief and darkness that God comes closest calls us by name and reminds us who we are and then sends us out again to love again, to live again, to fill the world with light and to tell the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. as we turn our hearts toward prayer. I invite when I say God of resurrection for you to respond, hear our prayer. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the church throughout the world, that as we celebrate the feast of Jesus' resurrection, we may renew our faith and strengthen our witness in Jesus' name. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For pastors, teachers, and ministers, for the one for whom we search and those who lead that search, that they may be wise in leadership, humble in service, and fearless in the face of evil. God of resurrection, hear our prayer for governments of the world and its leaders, that they may practice compassion and reject the politics that use death and suffering as a means of control. 
God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For our planet Earth, that people may be good stewards of its resources and share in its abundance. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the poor and the stranger, that they may receive a place of refuge, hope, and hospitality. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For the sick and those in distress, that they may find healing for their pain and be restored to fullness of life. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For our neighbors, that together we may dwell in harmony. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. For our enemies, that we may love them and be agents of reconciliation in the name of Jesus. God of resurrection, hear our prayer. Almighty God, receive these prayers we offer, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, use us for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts that we bring to this community compound and create resurrection power, helping us to awaken wholeness in the broken, strength in the weakened, and liberation for all living in the midst of injustice. Let us share our generosity with, with each other and the community. The offering will now be received. It's 
For the wondrous ways this offering will bless this community, help us nurture caring relationships with our neighbors and do our part to liberate all who are experiencing oppression. We dedicate these gifts. Let this offering and the works of our hands and feet be the resurrection we need to see in the world. Amen. You may be seated. In the United Church of Christ, we practice what we call open table communion, which means that whether you are a member here or a guest or visitor, you are invited to take the sacrament with us. The table of bread and cup is now to be made ready. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been here often and you who have not been for a while. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed, come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. Let us pray. Loving God, through your, your goodness, goodness, we have, have this bread and cup, cup to offer, which, which earth has given and human hands have made. May, may we know your presence in the sharing of this bread, so that, that we may know your touch in all bread, all things. things. May we know your love in the sharing of this cup, so that we may know your grace within all that sustains us. We celebrate the life that Jesus has shared among his community through the centuries and shares with us now. Made one in Christ and one with each other, we offer these gifts and with them ourselves a single holy living sacrifice. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We offer you praise, dear God, and hearts lifted high. For in the communion of your love, Christ becomes close to us and we become close to Christ. Therefore, with the whole realm of nature around us, with earth, sea, and sky, with all the saints before and beside us, 
with kindred in faith, east and west, we sing to you. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is our brother Jesus who walks with us on the road of our world's suffering and who is known to us in the breaking of the bread. On the night of his arrest, Jesus sat at the table with his disciples and he shared a meal with them. And while they were eating, he took the bread, he gave thanks to God, he blessed it and he broke it. And he shared it with them and said, this is my body broken for you. And while they were eating, he also took the cup and he gave thanks to God and he blessed it and he shared it with them and said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Pour it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this each time you drink of it in remembrance of me. Hear, O Christ, and breathe your spirit upon us and upon these gifts we are about to share. May they become for us your body, vibrant with your life, healing, renewing, and make us whole. And as the bread and cup which we now eat and drink are changed into us, may we also be changed into you, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh, loving and caring in the world. Amen. Amen. He whose table was open to all is now present in this bread. He whose word welcomes friends and strangers offers friendship through this cup. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are ready. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still
fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me O Christ, we thank you for the feast of life, fed by your love and strengthened by your life. May we humbly accept your call to go into this world, to live with hope, and to share your joy. You commission us to feed as we have been fed, forgive as we have been forgiven, and to love as we have been loved. Thanks be to God. Amen.
words of benediction. Uh, I invite you to stay in the sanctuary. You could go ahead and sit down at that point, uh, but don't want you to miss that our special music this morning is actually here at the end of service um, with the choir singing the Alleluia Chorus. You want us to say something, Andrea? Uh, anyone who knows the Alleluia Chorus who wants to join us, we have music. We would love to have you join us for that, so please come up. Uh, you can start coming up after the benediction. Take these words with you. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all, be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. And all the people said, Amen.
Thanks for the job. Oh, that note is high. 